continue straight on. Um, and um, I, I realised after my um, first talk that it might have been helpful to mention that um, I have a, a book on suffering. It's not available here, um, but it, it is available on uh, Amazon or um, directly from IVP. It's called Why? Looking at God, Evil and Personal Suffering. And actually, you know, um, to hear Dave just mention earlier the importance of story, what Why does is combine stories of people who are Christians but have suffered some awful things and yet are continuing to follow Jesus. Uh, it, this book interweaves stories with um, some of the responses to difficult questions that, that we ourselves ask and that our friends also ask. Uh, I'll do one more shameless plug as well, which is that uh, in February there's another book um, coming out specifically on the topic of natural disasters that I wasn't able to really unpack uh, this, uh, this morning, and that's called Broken Planet. So look out for that in February of next year. So what I'd love to do now is a, a gear shift uh, and think about the question, is there anything special about being human? We, again, as we think about the news and all the kind of issues in contemporary conversation, many of them really boil down to the question, what does it mean? to be a human being? What are we as people? Questions like, will artificial intelligence one day overtake human abilities? I was in uh, just cycling through Oxford the other day and saw the first kind of driverless bus being piloted, and it was a bit of a hairy experience to be behind this. Anyway, another question, should human beings be cloned? <coughs> How should we care for the elderly and an aging population, especially those with degenerative diseases? And there are so many other questions out there. And each of these areas leads us to ask the question, what is a human being? What is the deepest, most important thing about us? Is there anything special about us? Or are we just machines, just advanced apes that have happened to climb our way to the top of the evolutionary tree? Or are we even just souls trapped in a body that will one day escape and so who we are here and now is of less importance? Is there anything special about people? And I guess this question also has personal relevance to us. What is the value of my life? Does my life matter? Do I have value that is independent of my family background, education, salary, state of health, contribution to society? What I want to do in this talk, in a bit of a whistle-stop tour of this question, is to look at some of the different views expressed in culture today about human value. And then I want to look at uh, a biblical perspective on how we would answer this question, is there anything special about being human? And so what we will find today in secular society is, is f roughly four different views, although there are probably more than that. And the first of those is this, that humans have no inherent value. We live in a material universe with no God, and there is nothing inherently unique or special about humans. The 20th century philosopher and atheist Jean-Paul Sartre uh, is one such person who believed this and he would have said there's no ultimate grounding for human beings. If we look to scientific narratives, they tell us that we are on an earth, a spinning ball, thankfully not a disc, that has been around for, uh, in a universe that's been around for 12 billion years and earth itself for four and a half billion years, and the, the human race has been around for the last 200,000 years. And so if we look at the time since, since the universe began, our appearance is at the last second in a 24-hour period. We have literally appeared in the 11th hour. Scientifically speaking, human beings are unbelievably insignificant. We are a blip on the landscape of a vast cosmos. And one human life, even within that, is even less significant. And a number of other scholars have drawn similar conclusions, perhaps looking at 
this through slightly different lenses. Um, Francis Crick, um, co-discoverer of the DNA double helix, is known to have described humans as nothing but a pack of neurons. The historian Yuval Harari, in his book, best-selling book, Homo Deus, describes humans as algorithms. An ethicist and utilitarian Peter Singer is well known for his views on animal rights, advocating that they should be treated uh, no less uh, well than humans, and has coined the term speciesism to denote when preferential treatment is being shown to humans over and above animals. And so that is one view that is out there, that humans have no inherent value. There is nothing uh, particularly special about us. Now, a second view, which kind of flows from the first, really, is to say that human value is linked to utility. We are valued to the extent that we can bring something. We are valued not for who we are, but for what we do, what we bring, what we contribute, what we create. And I guess this is also expressed in evolutionary biology in a sense. According to Darwin, we've, we've evolved certain traits that over time have distinguished Homo sapiens from the rest of the animal kingdom. But these have been acquired, these have been earned, they're not inherent. And I guess we live in a society that is steeped in this mindset that human value is linked to our productivity. And many live according to this mantra. And even as Christians, we can slip into this way of thinking all too easily. We can put our sense of value around our achievements, our career, our intelligence, the letters before or after our name, or even our children's achievements, or our grandchildren's achievements. We gain our sense of value through what's happening in the next generation and the generation after that. Or we might gain our sense of value from the number of followers that we have on social media, or our popularity at school, or the relationships that we have. Even the role at church that we have may be that which gives us our real sense of value. Our value can even be tied up with the things that we do for God. You see, this approach says people are valued for what they do, for what they bring. And that is fine if we can continue to contribute that and if things are going well. But what do we do when a person is no longer able to produce, create, or has never been able to contribute to society in, in any of those ways? Or someone who is in a state of degeneration and is gradually grieving the loss of that ability to contribute. Does their life cease to have value? Well, we'll critique these views in a minute. Hold tight. But let's look at a third view. A third view is that humans are a stepping stone between biological evolution and technological evolution. Um, you'll probably be familiar with writers on artificial intelligence like Max Tegmark, Ray Kurzweil, and so on. And they say, look, evolution was just the beginning. There's a vast technological future ahead of us. Now that we have, in, in Tegmark's words, broken free from our evolutionary shackles. Precisely because there's nothing inherently valuable about human beings, one day we will be superseded by super intelligent beings. Our carbon-based life will ultimately be overtaken by silicon-based life. Uh, the, the point uh, at which the singularity, the point at which machines will be able to far surpass the intellectual abilities of any human being. Uh, that day, according to these guys, is ahead of us. And we are even more of a blip on the landscape with biological evolution behind us and technological advances ahead of us. There is nothing inherently significant or valuable about human beings. So humans are looking fairly insignificant, 
according to these three views. But here's the question. If there's nothing inherently special about people, why do we live as though there is? Maybe it's an have you ever wondered question. Have you ever wondered why then, if that is the case, we seem to live as though human beings are valuable. We don't seem to live as though they are packs of neurons or algorithms or blips on the silicon-based kind of, you know, timeline. We seem to live as though he people are inherently valuable. We see this in human rights campaigns. Uh, people are campaigning for justice for all kinds of causes, um, objecting to discrimination uh, of all kinds in our world. We see this in, the, um, in healthcare. You know, we've re relied so heavily on healthcare during the pandemic. That centers around the fact that each person alive deserves to be cared for precisely because they are valuable. Our bookshops are full of autobiographies talking about how people's lives matter and putting it on paper so that other people can read it. And now we each have a story to tell about how COVID-19 has impacted us. We live as though every life matters. That's how we live. And so how do we make sense of the fact that we seem to be drawn to that? As Andy said, how do we look back through the light beam to the, to the source of that? Because all of these movements and campaigns center around the belief that humans have inherent value and worth, regardless of their country of origin, cultural background, social status, economic status, marital status, gender, physical ability, mental capacity, and age. And so the question is, where do these beliefs come from? We seem to live as though we have inherent value. Where do these beliefs come from? Or as Andy said, what is the source of this pull towards human dignity that we seem to have? Well, that leads us to a fourth view that we see in society. There is a view out there that is a growing view, I would say, that would say, look, human value is just self-evident. Human dignity just is, it, it just is. It, it's self-evident. And I guess this view comes from the fact that so much of Western society now is steeped in this highly prized value that humans do matter. You know, the American uh, Declaration of Independence and Bill of Rights later, right at the heart of that is this you know, a belief that all men and women are born free and equal in dignity and rights um, and have the right to life, liberty, and, and so on, the pursuit of happiness. Right at the heart of um, the establishment of the USA, for example, is this notion of human dignity. We also know that, you know, at the formation of the UN at the end of the Second World War, they wanted to put human dignity right at the heart of, of the UN Declaration on Human Rights um, with the aim of preventing a repeat of the Holocaust. That was the reason for doing it. Um, and so we have a, a, a culture, and this you know, Human Rights uh, Declaration in the UN has been translated into over 500 languages and has resulted in more than seven um, human rights treaties in over 70 countries since the Second World War. And so we live in a society and a culture that is steeped in this highly prized uh, holding of human dignity. And so it can seem that it is self-evident. But it's important at this point to make people aware that it has not always been the case that human dignity is self-evident. Actually, if you go to the ancient world and take a look at how people lived, rights were not a thing. Different pe certain people were more valuable than other people, and that was self-evident at that time. We have not arrived at the values that we have from nowhere in a vacuum. We could look at all kinds of examples of how this was the case. Um, just very briefly, we could look at healthcare. 
We take it as we're so accustomed to the notion that people are deserving of healthcare and every person uh, deserves to be cared for. But in the ancient world, uh, uh, the approach to illness was very different and those with illnesses, disabilities and deformities uh, and other things were seen as weaker. And, and it was not unusual to abandon disabled newborn infants in the open air, leaving them to die. Also during times of plague, and there were a number in the ancient world, if you had the means, what you did was you get out of town and you leave people that have no means to leave town to stew in all the viruses and, and bacteria and, and their lives. If you have the means, you leave. You do not stay and care for the sick. It was the Galileans that stayed and cared for the sick and showed hospitality to the sick, which is where we get our word hospitals from. And it was they did that precisely on the basis of their belief that human beings had inherent dignity and suffering was not punishment and therefore people deserved to be helped. It was a response to the command of Jesus to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But that was utterly radical at the time, and that was not self-evident by any means. And it took many centuries to transform Western, the Western world. And we live, and um, people like, um, you might be interested to read Tom Holland's book, Dominion, and also um, Glenn Scrivener's book, The Air We Breathe. And essentially, the, the point there is that it seems so obvious to us that these values are right, but it has not always been the case. But it's part of the air that we breathe, and we just don't even think about it. And so in response to the belief that human dignity is self-evident, we could ask, look, what is the most compelling basis for human value and dignity? What is the most compelling argument for where this comes from? In a godless universe, the argument is that humans just have value. They've just arisen out of uh, a, a universe that has no value, but humans suddenly have value and they have arisen out of that. Or you could argue that actually we live in a universe that has had value right from the beginning. We live in a value-laden universe because God exists and God is good and he has made this beautiful world and then has made human beings in his image. And so, of course, that brings us to the basis for human dignity, which is that right at the beginning of the creative work of God, God created human beings in his image. Genesis 1, we see that then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule uh, or have responsibility over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God made mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. With the remainder of my talk, I'm just going to give you a, an overview of what does it mean to be made in the image of God then? What does that actually mean? If there is something unique and different about us, what can we draw out of Genesis as we think about this? So very briefly, firstly, that humans are uniquely able to think and reason. Dave has already um, talked about this, so I won't linger on it. But there's something very important about the fact that we have a mind. Where does this come from? And it's not enough to say that it's simply packs of neurons. And I have a, a book saying why, if you, um, you'd like to think um, some more about that. Brains don't think, people think using their brains and so where does the conscious mind come from does it come from a random universe of matter or does it come from the fact that god has a mind and that we are made in his image and therefore have a mind to use and to be a christian is to be a thinker which is why we're all here right not to throw your brain out of the window or your mind so uniquely able to think and reason second thing we can learn 
is that human value is inherent. It is not functional. It is not related to what we can contribute. It is related, it is based on what we have been given by God. You know, in other creation stories that the author of Genesis was contrasting with, the um, humans in those stories were made for their utility. Their role was to serve the gods with food. Their existence was based on their productivity and their service. But we see something extraordinary in Genesis. What does God do? He provides humans with food. In other words, anything that you might be tempted to think, that's your purpose for being here, I'm going to give you that so you will get the message that you are known and seen and loved for who you are, not for what you bring. We may bring some great things. That is not the foundation of our being. The most fundamental and central thing about each person alive is that they are made known and seen and loved by God for who they are. And of course, the third thing that we learn is that all human beings are equal to each other in value and dignity. There have been all kinds of inequalities in society, both in history and today. We could think about the civil rights movement or apartheid in South, South Africa or the right for women to vote uh, in, in this country and others. There have been all kinds of inequalities between different members of the human race, but Genesis says all human beings are equal in value, regardless of race, gender, and any other category. Um, and of course, that is, again, in radical contrast to the views of the time. You, you can read passages that talk, that um, Plato and Aristotle, for example, talk about some people being slaves by nature and other people being free by nature. You are born into a certain category. There are natural inequalities. That was the status quo in the ancient world. And so here comes the author of Genesis. And then here comes the person of Jesus overturning the cultural norms of his day, talking to people from different races and unwanted genders and, um, and, and basically um, bringing down dividing walls of hostility. And then you have Paul in the New Testament saying, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is equality between people before God and with each other. And if we were to live as though that were the case, what kind of world would we be living in? I could also talk about how we are deeply relational. I won't have time to go into that. But we are made in the image of God. We're made for relationship. We discovered that during the pandemic again in new ways. It's not good for us to be alone. We are relational beings because we are made by a God who is relational. And we are ultimately made for relationship with him. And then finally, um, we are made, one of the other, other things of what it means to be made in the image of God is that we have responsibility. In the ancient Near East, images of the king were placed in towns and cities as a reminder of the king's authority and that citizens were accountable to him. That's what it meant to have an image set up that the people in that area were accountable to the king. And so similarly, to be bearers of the image of God reminds us that God is sovereign and we are accountable to him. And when... You know, Genesis talks about us being responsible for the rest of the created order. That does not mean we have license to run roughshod over the natural world and the resources that we've been given. We have been given a responsibility and we are accountable to God for how we use the resources that he has given us. And this has relevance in areas like animal welfare, in ecology, in agriculture, in environmental care and in uh, the extent to which human factors are influencing climate change.
we as image bearers are to exercise dominion, not domination. And that has, uh, is, is an area that is obviously being discussed. So as I draw to a close, I just want to return to this question. I've tried to show you that um, the most persuasive argument for human dignity is actually that, that actually God exists and has given humans the inherent value because we are made in his image. But you might be asking, how do we truly know that we have value? And maybe if we're talking to a friend or a family member, how do we really know that we have this value that you speak of? Two things. Firstly, value is communicated through time and attention. We give time and attention to the things that we value most. If someone tells you that they love you and then they spend the whole weekend on Facebook or YouTube or Candy Crush or on the golf course, you might question if they actually mean it. We give time and attention to the things that we value most. In the Christian faith, we're told that God was so invested in people, he became one of us. How much more time and attention can you give than from entering eternity into human history as one of us? If you want to know whether humans are valuable or not, look at Jesus. He became one. You are loved. Your friends and family are loved. And he showed people that they mattered, often people on the margins, like the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. He said these extraordinary words to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. I wonder if she'd ever been called daughter before. And then finally, value is communicated by the price that we are prepared to pay for something. Anyone who has sold their house or put something on eBay will know that the value of something is determined by what you're prepared to pay. <coughs> the Christian faith says we're out of kilter with God and we need restoring and we're not able to fix this ourselves. We need someone else to pay on our behalf. What was the price that God was willing to pay for us? He was willing to pay the highest price that there is. The price of the life of God himself. The price of Jesus Christ. If you want to know how valuable you are, look at the cross of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen.